Great. Um, and all registrants will be receiving both the recording and a copy of the slide deck in uh, the email that you registered with. So any links that you see in this presentation, you will be able um, to click on. Great. Um, so with that, let's take a look at our agenda. First off, we're going to introduce the federal budget process as it is in a normal year. Uh, then we will talk about NALCAB's advocacy priorities around appropriations, and then we'll discuss how the appropriations process is going this year in advance of fiscal year 2022. Uh, then we'll share some helpful resources um, that may help as you engage with this process um, and preview some upcoming events you should be informed about. And then, of course, we'll wrap up with questions. So our speakers today are Clorinda Landeros, NALCAB's Director of Public Policy, and myself, Chelsea Burrows. So Clorinda is NALCAB's uh, Director of Public Policy. Prior to joining NALCAB, she worked in the U.S. House of Representatives um, for over a decade. Um, my name is Chelsea. I'm a Public Policy Associate here. Feel free to reach out to either of us. Our emails are here on this slide, and you can also reach us at the general policy at nalcab.org email address. So with that, I will hand it over um, to Corinda to get started on the federal budget. Thanks. Thank you, Chelsea. Am I un unmuted? Great. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate you making this a, a part of your day. Um, as we all know with the work that we do, strong neighborhoods are the foundation for economic mobility, which is why NALCAP advocates for robust federal funding for community development programs that strengthen underserved neighborhoods and increase opportunities for the people living in them. This includes federal funding streams that promote affordable housing, uh, small business training and development, and spur equitable neighborhood development. Some specific programs that many of you are familiar with include um, CDBG, Home Investment Partnerships Program, um, Community Economic Development Program, and others. Uh, all of these are funded by Congress during its annual budget and appropriations process. And all of us as people in groups providing these services in our communities know how critical funding these programs are and have insight on where the holes are and what resources are needed to help uplift our communities and increase opportunities for communities of color and low income families. So today we're going to help you navigate the federal budget process, not only to know how money gets to our communities, but so that we can best advocate for them. So with that, let's talk about the federal budget process. The US Constitution says no money shall be drawn from the treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. What this means is Congress has granted the power under the US Constitution to allocate federal dollars, collect taxes and borrow money. This doesn't mean that the president uh, doesn't play an important role. The president is influ influential due to the duty imposed by statute to submit an annual budget to Congress. Um, the president's budget establishes the administration's priorities and it's kind of their wish list, but it is not a mandate. Uh, the president plays an important role also um, by virtue of the constitutional power to approve and veto measures. Um, which, of course, Congress can override by a two-thirds vote um, in both chambers. But that's the role in the budget process between Congress and the president. Um, and so the typical timeline for the annual appropriation cycle, uh, it's kicked off with the president's budget submission, which uh, is usually or, uh, you know, the targeted to be the first Monday in February. And the whole process ends with the signing of the appropriations bills before the new fiscal year begins, October 1st. So the president submits a budget request, Congress adopts a budget resolution, appropriations committees adopt specific appropriations bills, appropriations bills are submitted to the House and Senate for approval, and lastly, the president signs these appropriations bill and the budget becomes law. That is very much a perfect world situation, you know, scenario, um, but, and, and very, you know, quickly going through it. So to go into it a bit more detail, what happens after the president submits his budget to Congress, the House and Senate appropriations subcommittees then hold hearings on the segments of the budget under their jurisdiction, after which they draft, mark up, and report bills under their jurisdiction to their respective full committees. The idea is that these committees are using the president's budget proposal as, as a guide um, uh, 
if they, but not as they don't have to enact the numbers that the president is, is you know, hoping for. The House and Senate committees on appropriations are organized into 12 subcommittees, with each subcommittee having responsibility for developing one regular appropriations bill to provide funding for departments and activities within its jurisdiction. So there are 12 appropriations bills. There are 12 funding streams, um, and those come out of the 12 subcommittees um, of the Congressional Appropriations Committees. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Chelsea to talk about those 12 funding bills and give some examples of programs they fund and that support the work that we all do. Thanks, Brenda. Yes, so this uh, chart on this page, you know, it, there's a lot going on, but to give you a sense of what we're going for here, um, the left column is a list of appropriation subcommittees. So if you go to appropriations.house.gov or appropriations.senate.gov, they will have a list of their subcommittees, and both of them have the same 12 subcommittees. Um, and they all have their own jurisdictions, and they all handle different uh, portfolios of the federal government. So in, during the federal budget process, these subcommittees are the ones responsible for deciding how much federal funding each uh, federal program in their jurisdiction and their portfolio um, is going to receive. So this is a list that we pulled from NowCab's survey of members. Uh, you should have taken the NowCab federal funding survey um, either right at the end of last year or the beginning of this year. Um, and we hope you take next year's as well. Um, and so this is a list of those programs. So this is just to give you a sense of what their jurisdiction is. Of course, there are many more federal programs and, and later in the presentation, Clarenda will show you uh, grants.gov and sam.gov, which you know have a more uh, comprehensive database of those. But to give you a sense of you know the most important or, or programs that you probably are familiar with, um, so the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development and Related Agencies Committee, all the way at the bottom, they're responsible for CDBG, the Community Development Block Grant. They're also responsible for Home Investment Partnerships Program. Those are things that you know, we've all heard of before. Um, small Business Administration Programs, those um, are in financial services and general government, so SBA Prime, SBA Microloan. Um, there is a number of other programs that are relevant to the NowCab network. USDA Rural Development is handled by the Agriculture Subcommittee. Um, there's a lot going on here, but the bottom line is there's a lot of ways uh, to get involved in, in advocating, whether that's at the subcommittee level, committee level, um, or all of Congress. So with that, I will hand it over back to Clarinda um, to get into budget resolutions. Budget resolution, yes, that was number two on the timeline. So what is the budget resolution? The budget resolution sets spending ceilings for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, the target date for completion of the budget resolution is April 15th, but that uh, is a target date. Very um, obviously that didn't happen this year. Um, um, the budget resolution does not allocate funds for, for specific programs or accounts, but allocations of total spending are made to committees with spending jurisdiction. So the budget resolution is not sent to the president and does not become law. It's a blueprint for Congress um, and, and usually a chance for the, for the majority party, in this case the Democrats, to have big picture debates on what it wants to do on discretionary spending, mandatory spending, and taxes. Um, importantly, the budget resolution also unlocks the budget reconciliation process, which I, I imagine if you're watching the news, you're hearing this word reconciliation. The reconciliation process allows Congress to use an expedited procedure to move legislation, specifically to move legislation through the Senate without needing to meet the 60 vote cloture threshold, so a simple majority is needed. So an important thing that we want that I, we want to draw your attention to for this that's that's different in this budget and uh, appropriations process is community project requests. Um, in February, the Appropriations Committee announced that it will accept requests from members of Congress for community project requests for fiscal year 2022 appropriations bills. So those 12 bills that Chelsea just went over. Um, 
what community project requests are, you know, is generally defined as a spending provision in the federal appropriations legislation that provides a designated amount of discretionary funding to a specific entity for a specific purpose. Uh, you all may know these as earmarks. Um, Congress has prohibited the practice of earmarks uh, since 2011 due to questionable abuses regarding how legislator dir legislators directed funds. Um, however, in recent years, members on both sides of the aisle have expressed interest in lifting the earmark moratorium and return power to Cong Congress to direct funding for local needs, particularly in, in, in the wake of COVID. Um, members of Congress setting that they know the needs of, of their districts. So a number of guardrails were created to help increase transparency and accountability in ways that it didn't apply 10 years ago. So members of Congress may submit up to 10 local projects to the committee for funding consideration. 10 of the 12 appropriations bills have eligible accounts. So that's, this excludes legislative branch and state and foreign ops, but everything else has eligible accounts. Um, eligible projects include the wide range, but a few examples, um, rehabilitation of housing, um, capital improvements for public facilities, um, equipment to provide broadband, broadband services in rural areas. Um, the, this project funding request is an opportunity for eligible entities, which is nonprofits, to avoid the complexities of the federal grants process. That is one of the real, um, well, to address local needs and avoid the complexities of the federal grants process. Um, but of note, with the limited number of requests each member of Congress is allowed to submit being just 10, this is going to be or has been and will continue to be a very competitive process. Um, nevertheless, this will become an annual process unless it's discontinued in the future. So next year we'll present a new opportunity. Um, it is already, the deadline has already passed for this year, but um, to knowing that this is an opportunity out there, learning about it now for, for the next fiscal year, finding out what the eligible accounts are in each of the bills, talking, you know, uh, getting information. A lot of members of Congress have information on their website about this and how to make a request. Um, I can tell you when, when I worked for a member of Congress, the um, community project requests, the, you know, hundreds came in. So it's good to be um, knowing what, you know, what would make your, your funding, your, your request competitive. Talk, and again, talking to your, to your member of Congress about that. Um, so from there, uh, what are, you know, we talked about the budget process, we talked about the timeline, uh, we talked about what's different this year and um, overall appropriations in the 12 bills and then NALCAB's appropriations priorities, which Chelsea mentioned a little bit earlier comes from the federal funding survey that we've done, also um, funding streams that we know are critical to bringing resources to underserved um, communities, low-income communities, and communities of color. This includes HUD's affordable housing programs, um, housing and urban development, um, SBA's access to capital programs, Small Business Administration, that's SBA, USDA's world development programs, this includes um, affordable housing as well, um, community development financial institutions, and programs that fund uh, consumer financial protections. Um, and we will go into those in a deeper dive um, in the next webinar um, in the next month when we start talking about um, reaching out to Congress and, and actually doing the work of advocating for these programs. Um, we will do a deeper dive on to, in, into those, what the funding levels are, what we'd like them to be, and, and so forth. So from there, What's this year look like for the budget? Um, how, how does the, the timeline that we just discussed, how does it compare to what's going on this year? So, well, it's very different. So this year, um, uh, Biden released his full budget request um, late May, May 28th. This is a particularly late start for the annual budget and appropriations process. Um, in terms of the budget resolution, the Senate is taking the lead on that. It's still, I mean, I think, um, it, it's the Schumer has said that he wants the, the hope is to have the budget resolution passed um, before the August recess. I and mean, this is very, very late. Um, and then appropriation subcommittees in the House have reported each of the 12 funding bills to the full committee. 
Um, but of the 12 appropriations bills, eight have passed the full committee in the House. Um, zero have been considered in the U.S. House or the Senate floor. So what this means is they're still coming together. There is still a lot of work to be done between now and the end of the fiscal year. And there is still um, many opportunities for us to advocate um, for, for funding streams that are important to us, that our organizations get, um, and that help us do our work. So in, in looking into those things further, some helpful resources just for more information um, is the, the President's Fiscal Year 22 budget, if, if you're interested in what's in that. Um, there's a link for that. Guidelines on community project funding requests. And, and then we included some, some good ones that we saw members of Congress had on their websites. Uh, you can, I would always check with your member of Congress first. They may or may not. It really varies um, depending on the member how helpful it is. Um, so we just put some good, you know, good ones that we noticed that had like guides and drafts um uh grants 101 so we just talked about all of these bills and and the funding opportunities that they provide and then grants 101 is is where to how to apply for some of these grants um and then uh sam or system of for award management of federal domestic assistance is is another good resource too so with that i will turn it back to chelsea to talk about next steps Thank you, Corinda. Um, so first and most relevant to this webinar is our Summer in the States campaign. So this is what we've been referencing throughout about an opportunity uh, to advocate on these issues uh, soon. So Summer in the States is now CAB's annual advocacy campaign on the federal budget. Uh, we will launch it this year on August 5th um, by discussing our chosen priority programs, um, which, you know, these are the federal programs that we're going to be urging Congress to robustly fund in fiscal year 2022. So throughout the month of August, we're going to be setting up meetings between you and your policymakers. We're going to make sure that you're fully prepared for these virtual meetings. It is all virtual. Um, and this is a great way to get engaged on this important issue. Um, if you've never done it before, if you've done it many times, uh, we are excited to have you join us. Um, it's not just meetings, however. We're also going to provide other resources, um, letters you can write to your you know, senators and members of the House, a social media toolkit so you can get involved um, on various social networks, phone call scripts, and more. So this campaign is, is really critical to ensure that Latino communities are going to get the financial resources they need to recover and thrive after the COVID pandemic. Uh, we really hope to have you join us. Uh, you can register now. Um, in a few minutes, I will drop the registration link for that in the chat. Um, but you can also find more information on it in our newsletter, which I will discuss um, in just a minute. And then after uh, summer in the States, we will be having our second annual 2021 Public Policy Summit, and that will be held on October 6, 2021. Uh, we just released the date for this, so please save the date. We'll be releasing more information about our featured speakers and our guests as we get closer to the event, um, but we look forward to having you there. It will be a full day of discussing, um, you know, meaty public policy issues with you know, elected officials, industry experts, leaders, all kinds um, of great guests. And then with that, I wanna make sure that you're informed, um, that you know what's coming up with us next. Uh, Policy and Politica is our weekly newsletter, it goes out every Friday, and it is the best place to find um, what NowCab is up to and what opportunities we you know, are providing. Sometimes we have funding opportunities, sometimes we have advocacy opportunities, but we always have, you know, great events about public policy um, that we think you should tune into. Um, you know, the, the top news of the week, uh, helpful resources, that kind of thing. So you can sign up at nowcab.org slash sign up for newsletter. Um, there is dashes in between the words, so I uh, refer to the slide here. Uh, we also encourage you to follow us on Twitter at NowCap Policy. This is a separate account from our general NowCap one. Um, that's where we're doing a lot of advocacy tweeting um, during summer in the States, but that's also where we remind you of our webinars and engage on a lot of other great issues. Um, and if you have any questions, again, feel free to reach out to us at any time. Um, everyone on the policy team has access to the policy at nowcap.org email, um, so feel free to reach out. Okay. 
And with that, um, I'm going to open the floor uh, to some questions. Let me get the chat and Q&A box in front of me. One moment. So Amber is asking, is there a meeting next Thursday at 1 p.m.? Um, are you talking about the public policy committee meeting? I don't see that. Oh, so there's a community development workshop next week, if that's what you're oh. referring to. Um, and that's another webinar, uh, but we do not have a committee meeting next week. Um, you can clarify a little bit in the chat if I didn't quite get it, but let me get the um, link for some red states in the chat while you were thinking. There we go. Okay, so that's the link for our Summer in the States campaign. Um, and if you register for the webinar, you're registering um, for the entire campaign. So. so Otto is asking, um, can you give some examples of the types of projects that get funded through uh, CPF, the Community Project Funding? Um, and if possible, he'd like to get a sense of the size of those projects. Okay. That is the great question. And um, I put the, if you click on in the resources one, because they're so varied in the accounts for each bills um, of each of the 12 bills, it was, you really have to dig a little bit. Um, but if you click on those, the links that we put there, they're descriptive. Oh, you can't see the link. Um, I can re-put it in there. I'm on um, it, Miranda. Go ahead. On there that. are there are um, descriptions for each bill and um, each uh, account that you can be funded, and then uh, each account that can be funded and just and uh, examples of projects in those resources. Um, if that's helpful. I don't know if they're talking about the link to the community project funding or the link to the webinar. To the webinar, um, okay. I, ju I just put it in. So I fixed because it. For, the, for all of those resources for the, the community project funding um, are like, will be sent around with this webinar, but if, if for some reason you, you don't get it or you, you know, need more information, reach out, feel free to, you know, at any time. Um, and I can send it to you directly as well. But the presentation slides will be sent out with all of that information. Yeah, and, and one thing on that is that this, you know, earmarks haven't been around for a decade. So this is kind of new um, to many members of Congress as well as the people applying. Um, so, you know, feel free, you know, we're here as a resource for you, but you can also get you know, more specific information on what's going on in your district and how your member of Congress is handling it uh, by contacting um, their office. And how they're prioritizing requests. I mean, that is up to each member. And so that is something um, when, when you're looking to apply for this next next funding cycle is a good question to ask um, your member of Congress is how are you prioritizing or how are you choosing the 10 projects um, that you're submitting to the committee? And because that's going to be different for every single member um, and see maybe for, you know, one an example would be that I've seen some members say is um, the wealth of community support. So if, it, if, if you submit a request for community project funding and you include um, 10 other organizations in support or something like that, showing a, a large amount of support for this project within the, organ, within the community um, is, is one that uh, as some members have said, inch, inches it up to the top of the list. But that mean, that, that would be the number one thing I would be asking a member. I mean, I would encourage everyone to ask their member of Congress because with just 10 spots, um, what does it take to get to be number one? Yeah. Or one of those 10. Um, so in addition to the link uh, to register for some rent states, I have also put in the chat uh, the register to or the link to sign up for Policy and Politica, um, because that's where we'll be announcing, you know, our speakers for the Policy Summit, um, you know, any additional resources for the Summer in the States campaign and all of that. Okay. 
Okay. Any last questions before we wrap up? I'll give I'll give it a minute. Okay, well, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, as we mentioned, feel free to reach out at any time if you uh, need assistance. Uh, we are available on all of these platforms. Um, so thank you for taking the time. Have a good afternoon.